This is ESG Decoded, the podcast powered by Climco to provide relevant, actionable updates related to business innovation and sustainability. Join Caitlin Allen and Amanda Shea of Climco for thoughtful, nuanced conversations with industry leaders that explore the complexities, the risks, and the opportunities connected to all things ESG. I'm Yvonne Harris, a consultant and a co-host, and I will be collaborating with Caitlin and Amanda for the discussions that we will present on this podcast. Put simply, ESG is everything that's not on your balance sheet. This leaves room for misunderstanding, oversimplification, and the tendency towards one-size-fits-all perspectives. None of that will happen on this podcast. Enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Amanda Shea. Thanks again for joining us back on ESG Decoded Podcast. Today, I'm really excited to be talking to Kyle Lukianic, who's the Managing Director of Impact Investing at Upmetrics and also sits on the Board of Directors of Good Returns. Kyle and I met several years ago, it seems like, um, but pre-COVID at an Impact Investing Conference at, I believe, the University of St. Thomas. And was it, oh gosh, maybe three or four years ago, Kyle, when you made the trip down here? I don't remember. Do you? Is time really linear anymore? I feel like... It's just one of those things that seems like forever ago, but it also feels like it was just yesterday at the same time. So I want to say it was 2017. I'm totally pulling that year yeah. up and I'm not sure if it's right, but that sounds in the ballpark. 2017 yes. sounds good. <laughs> yes. And thank you so much for making time for to join us today. And I really was inspired when I learned about Good Returns you know, back then. And I wanted to um, just catch up with you, find out about what's happening with Good Returns, how it's developed and all the cool stuff y'all are working on to help corporates and also foundation advance advance their causes and especially help them social entrepreneurs. And then also a little bit about what's happening and with Upmetrics and how you're helping to kind of quantify those outcomes. Anyways, let me pause for a moment and ask you to introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about who Kyle is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. I'm really excited about this. I love the podcast. I love um, the fact that you're talking about these things, especially from an investment lens and really focusing in on the ESG element with a special focus on the E and the S. That's um, the areas that I'm very passionate about. And the reason why is because I've spent the last decade or so in what is now known as the impact investing space. I think when I started, it was still, you know, what is impact investing, especially here in Dallas where I'm based, there was still kind of a confusion as to what that was, but have spent the last decade or so uh, really focused in on deploying capital to communities and capital to social entrepreneurs. And in the beginning stages of Good Returns, we had a distinct focus on how do we mobilize capital from corporations to do good in the world. And over time, as we experimented with models and things like that, one of the things that I think I shared with you early on was our cycle program, which was enabling corporations to lend interest-free to social enterprises that had a sustainable business model, but were producing a measurable, definable social outcome. And as part of that work, we had to build certain infrastructure to enable corporations to participate more fully. Most notably was a guarantee structure that um, when we started a a pilot with a corporation here in Dallas called Works Corporation, they wanted to lend capital out, not of their grant making, but out of their corporate foundation corpus. And because of that, they needed to know that their capital would come back and they weren't really interested in doing the underwriting on these organizations. It wasn't their business to fund social enterprises and no level of due diligence that we would perform would get them comfortable. So we actually partnered with a hedge fund here in Dallas, Texas to build a very unique fund where impact investors and foundations could invest capital. It stays continuously invested in the market, earns a market rate of return in a predefined strategy, but it's used as collateral to guarantee, in this case, the those zero interest loans to social enterprises. And we ran this and it was really exciting. Stanford Social Innovation Review did a whole article on it. And we were really excited for what that was. 
the pandemic hit, which made things a little more challenging and everyone was, you know, corporations were really struggled and, and how do they keep their operations going? How do they keep their talent engaged? Things like that. But something really neat came out of the pandemic as well, which is we actually had banks starting to come to us and saying, this is a really neat mechanism where we can basically make some of these nonprofits, some of these social enterprises that wouldn't necessarily qualify in our normal underwriting. We can now use this guarantee to de-risk them and price them in lower so we can deploy low interest lines of credit to some of these organizations using the guarantee as sort of that backstop. So there was this whole new channel that opened up um, to get capital to organizations using the bank essentially as the corporation. And then our um, fund would be sort of this um, conglomerate of where all investors could put their money in and we would be responsible for allocating the guarantee based on need and cause and what the foundations needed to make sure that they were aligned to from a cause focus as well. So that's sort of what has taken over, I would say, in the last two or three years. And now we're um, working on impact projects from housing to lines of credit that are supporting women entrepreneurs throughout the state of Texas through a great organization called Just that was started in Austin, actually, and is spreading to Houston, which is your backyard. But we see this infrastructure as not limited by geographical bounds or cause area, but more so just a piece of infrastructure that the impact investing ecosystem can use. I think what's so interesting about what the program you created, the cycle program, is that it allows for profits, whether that's a corporate, whether it's um, a, a bank, to to lend their money out and really to make an impact without, but as you mentioned, just in a way that de-risks the whole situation and in a way that allows them to make really further impact and and also collaborate with the nonprofits and the foundations in a different way than I think the traditional model of philanthropy, which if we give you money, then you deploy that money to the causes, right? And it, it turns it, it, it opens up maybe more capital. Um, so I'm assuming there's still those, hopefully those dedicated funds, you know, or percentage, whatever it is going to those foundations, but it just acts, allows these kind of, um, should I call it a short-term loan um, to happen? It, generally, they're they're more shorter term, but it's really the this case the lender, and in this this more updated version, the bank is really saying how long those terms are. In the the normal cycle program, we were focused on term loans, so we would say you know it's a year long or it's two years long. The lines of credit are really interesting and actually more advantageous on the social impact side because the organizations that are borrowing the capital are only paying on the amount that they pull down versus a term loan, whether you're using that capital actively or not, you're still paying interest on it, right? And you know, in our model, it didn't make a difference because the cycle originally was meant to be 0% interest. But what we see with this guarantee model is you know, if you can deploy capital at low interest, especially to some of these sustainable what I call uh, impact organizations that have a business model or producing revenue, but they may not be making like venture style returns and and have, you know, SaaS business models, but they're more manufacturing with the social impact component. And so low interest capital is very useful for them to scale and grow. And some of them may be formed as a nonprofit. So there is no opportunity to like, let's say, go raise equity investment. And so the idea of having this notion of impact focused debt that's low cost is very important to grow some of these enterprises. The challenge I think in getting some of that capital mobilized is how do you adjust for risk? And I think historically, a lot of these entities maybe have seen, be seen as more risky and therefore they would require a higher return. And by adding in this essentially blended structure where you have an investment fund that sits behind the dollars, then you can take some of that risk away, which just to be clear, that's not novel by any sense. Guarantees have been around for a long time. So I'm not saying like we came up with the guarantee notion, but the, the challenge that we saw in the normal guarantee profile was when folks guaranteed, often that money would have to be locked up. 
So mm-hmm. I'll give an example. We had a traditional guarantee, a standby letter of credit from a foundation guaranteeing one of our cycle loans. And the foundation actually had to put money in a checking account, a CD, for one year, pay 1% to the bank to issue this. And on top of that, they were getting, I don't know, less than a tenth of percent in interest on that CD. So it actually cost them money to give us this guarantee. And so for them, it just was a bad business decision. Um, You know, that why would we tie up our funds? We'd rather invest it in the market and give you the return as a grant. That would be better for us. And so we realized that wasn't scalable. But what our model does is it allows the guarantor to earn money in the market. So it stays actively invested. And over the the past couple of years, our investors have seen double digit returns on that. So they're guaranteeing this impact, they're facilitating this impact, but earning a market rate of return that the impact organizations aren't having to pay directly, which is often what happens in the normal transaction between impact investor and investee. And then tell me a little bit more about the organizations that are the end recipient of and able to you know, pull against this line of credit, for example. Are, are what's is there like an average amount or a medium amount, medium amount that they're they're able to access, or does it just depend? It depends. So one of the roles that we play, sort of as an intermediary in all this, is really lining up the guarantee, the banking institution, and then the impact organization on the ground based on need, the type of capital that they that they require, and then facilitating all that legal paperwork to make sure that the bank has the collateral it needs to give as lowest cost capital as possible to these impact organizations. So I'll give you the typical consultant answer, which is it it depends. (laughs) But, (laughs) But there are certain types of organizations that I would say are better suited for this. So I groups that tend to have a business model where they have quicker turnover as far as a product or service that they're selling would make it much easier probably to access this type of capital. So the example that I gave of Just down in Austin, they're providing smaller dollar loans to women entrepreneurs that don't have access to the traditional financial ecosystem. And so by giving them this opportunity they're usually smaller period loans. So we're talking you know, three to six months. And this is all on the Just website. So anyone, I encourage you to, to go check it out. They're smaller dollar loans. We're talking under $1,000. That's what made it hard for a bank to underwrite because it's all this small paper that, let's say, in the event of a default, it wasn't something that the bank would really be able to easily take in yeah. and take over. And so by providing this guarantee, you're taking some of that risk off. But Make no mistake, the just borrowers, they are probably the the best performing group of borrowers that you could see across the country. I mean, um, you know, look it up. Women borrowers um, are probably the best performing (laughs) cultures across geographies. and, And just is no different as far as the repayment rates that they have but ultimately the impact that they're having on these communities. So accessing this lower cost capital allows them to expand from Austin to Houston. They're up here in Dallas as well. And they're really saying we can take this business model across the country and really provide financial access to communities that have often been underserved, unbanked, and to really catalyze the entrepreneur on the ground with the capital that they need to thrive. That's amazing. I mean, just thinking about what Just is doing and, you know, there's been so many reports about how many women are leaving kind of the traditional workforce, and a lot of them are, you know, starting up their own own businesses and maybe, you know, kind of micro enterprises and stuff like that. So I think it's really interesting, this idea of how they can get these um, almost micro loans to support their new startups. And, and so they're not totally excluded from the economy. For this overall to scale, what's what do we need? Do we need more banks and people will, companies willing to loan? Do we need more of the on the found guarantors do we need more social enterprises to give the money to or is it one of the all of the above answers what, what do you think or maybe what's the chicken the egg maybe um, it, but what yes. do we need to kind of what do you imagine like what's your vision of to scale this what do we need more of i feel like every challenge in the impact ecosystem and even more specifically in impact investing is like a chicken and egg problem it seems <laughs> like and 
this is certainly no different. We've had so many conversations with, you know, investors. They're like, I want to put my money in the fund, but I want to have the impact organization clearly defined. And I want to have the bank lined up and ready to go. And the bank saying, well, we need to have the investor in the fund. And the impact organization is saying, well, we need to know which bank is lending to us. So it's like all these pieces that you have to sort of triangulate. And and what ends up happening is this like slow nudge of all three pieces until it all comes together finally. And, you know, obviously part of that is just the nature of doing something new and different. And so our hope is that that changes over time and it becomes a much more seamless. And I think it will, as you have many more investors in the fund and you have many more impact organizations in our network and you have many more banks, I, th- I see this as almost like a, a marketplace of sorts where you can come in and invest and allocate your guarantee to specific cause areas or geographical regions. And then you have a, a series of banks that are saying, we want to lend these organizations at this rate and this rate and this rate. And then you have impact organizations that are saying, we can take in this type of capital and us being able to perform that due diligence. So I think, you know, at scale, having more all online will just make this go a lot more seamless. In the short term, if if I had to choose one, I, I think the one that makes the most sense to grow as quickly as possible is probably the investors and the banks make the most sense, partially because the investors coming in, it's not like we're just having their capital sit. It's actively invested in the market in a, a predefined strategy. And the banks, just because they're on board doesn't mean that they're necessarily committed to doing certain deals. And so having them in the fold to have underwritten our fund and for them to say, you know, based on the performance of the fund, we're willing to give this amount of line of credit based on these dollars in the fund. Having those conversations up front makes it much easier to go out and find the projects and the impact organizations to fund. And what I understand is that these financial instruments are well known. They're used as just applying it to impact and impact babies, we can say. But they're tools that are, exist today just in the normal course of business. So it's not like we're something that's very hard to understand for the, maybe for, for me, for non-finance folks like myself, uh, <laughs> but for if you're you know, in the industry, you're going to be familiar with these products and these services and it's really just applying it to to impact. Instead. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And well said, nothing novel from a financial instrument perspective of what we're doing here. We're just plugging different instruments together in a way that we think solves for a need in the marketplace. But this idea of guaranteeing and things like that, I mean, student loans, a lot of people who have had student loans, your parents or your grandparents may have served as a guarantor or if you got a car loan or things like that. So this idea of guarantee is not unusual. And even in those instances, it's not like your parents had to put money aside in a separate account and you know lock it up and give the bank the key. It's just that they were kind of on the hook for it and they could still invest that capital in the market and they could still you know take out a mortgage elsewhere and things like that. But they were you know, guaranteeing or kind of standing behind those lines of credit and those loans that go to students and go to young borrowers and things like that. I think it's so important, though, to it's like you said, the ecosystem or building this marketplace that makes it easy for all these different players in this in the impact ecosystem to come together and kind of almost mm-hmm. creating that easy button for them <laughs> is what Good right. Returns is doing and making facilitating that collaboration. Something I also was thinking about is this kind of leads into your your the other thing that you do, uh, which is impact measurement and monitoring. Let's talk a little trans pivot over there and talk a little bit about kind of how you got into that. And I'm guessing it's connected to being able to <laughs> prove the outcomes of of the yes. impact investments, right? <laughs> I feel that any impact investor that's somewhat responsible for impact measurement will feel my pain, hopefully coming through this podcast of (laughs) how much time I spent in spreadsheets, Mm. clicking through and trying to aggregate metrics from very different investments with the goal of having something that our investors at, at good returns could understand and digest. Instead of me just sending the spreadsheets and saying, here's you know the data that's been reported across all these investments, I had to 
tell a story and and using data to do that. And it was a very painful process. Uh, I would spend probably three months out of the year just doing that element. And I'll say my pain was felt, but just as much, I felt like in a lot of instances, I was collecting data and it was all going one way. And I'm seeing this a lot in impact investing where it's, you know, the investor collects data and then they get asked for data from their investors. And then those people get asked for data. It all goes one way. And the those doing the work on the ground never see the value or the benefits of providing that data. I think, again, Stanford Social Innovation Review did a whole article on decolonizing data and this idea of we need to have more equitable data reporting and measurement tools and strategies. And I saw that firsthand just with what we were doing at at Good Returns and wanting to provide that value back. And I met Drew Payne and the Ummetrics team and they shared their platform, what they're working on, what they're doing, and what they built initially to work with nonprofits and foundations, but we're now seeing a lot of applicability within the impact investing ecosystem. And I saw that as a, a clear way to serve those trying to deploy capital to communities, which is kind of my my personal mission of, of what I want to be working on. And so I, I wanted to join the team. I wanted to join what they're building from a technology perspective to address some of those challenges that I just mentioned. And so this platform that they've built at every single step of the way, there's an intentionality around shareability. And so I'll you know, give examples of when data is collected by investors into the platform, we can actually build, curate, and customize dashboards per investment and then share those dashboards and that data back to the investment so that they don't just put their data in a black hole and Maybe it shows up in an impact report one day, but they can actually get that data back with benchmarks and standards and see how are they comparing. And that becomes a management tool for them. That also becomes a storytelling tool for them to share with their investors and with other folks in their community and ultimately to gauge whether they're having the impact that they thought they wanted to have. And that type of knowledge sharing and communication is so needed in the space. And I, I, I think from what I call IMM, but impact measurement and monitoring, that ecosystem needs to place a bigger uh, intentionality around making that possible. And you know, without it, I feel like measurement can often have a negative outcome just through the process and actually take away resources from the impact that that hopefully is is targeted to be achieved on the ground. You know, I work so much with a lot with reporting and communications out and communicating yeah. out to, you know, those key stakeholders and obviously investors are often many times a key stakeholder. I love the point that you bring up of how to basically bring that information back. So there's a feedback loop. It's not just a one-way communication, but it's there is really a feedback loop to help everyone and, and all the partners improve. Thank you. I feel like every time I talk to you, I learn something really cool or just a, a, thinking about something in a different way or thinking about, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and likewise, and, and this is, I mean, approving of the point, right? You and I communicating and sharing knowledge and sharing, you know, in this case, a, a data point, however you want to frame it up. But that's important. We have to have these these lines of communication and, again, fighting against that one way of just further up the food chain. There's people demanding certain sets of information, and so it gets asked, and then it gets compiled, and then it gets asked again and compiled. And it's like, what are we doing here? What? <laughs> I, I have a great colleague who always asks the question of in service of what, and I always try to ask myself that question and looking at our process or looking at what we're trying to accomplish and why are we collecting these data points? What is it in service of? And if it doesn't go back to those doing the work so that they can understand their own performance and whether things are being achieved, I I think we're really missing the mark as far as what needs to be done. And so with all that to say, like we need better systems, we need better tools, that provide equitable ways of collecting, organizing, analyzing, and sharing data. And that's why I joined the Upmetrics team because of what they're building and what I wanted to be a part of. 
And we're now working with investors in the space that share that desire and share that goal of not just making their processes more efficient, but building out a more equitable ecosystem where that collection of data and that sharing of data really has a purpose. And I'll make sure that we link in our show notes, the websites for good return and also for up metrics and also the report that you have with the Stanford Social Innovation Review about your work with Good Return. So for any of our listeners who want to read a little bit more about that, I'll make sure to link those up in the show notes. But Kyle, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, learn about any all the cool stuff you're involved with, what's the easiest way? Is it through, via the websites, LinkedIn? What's the easiest way to get a hold of you? Yeah, I would, I would definitely say if you're reaching out, you're interested in the work that we're doing at Upmetrics, feel free to go on the website and, and connect with folks there. We have a whole team, so don't feel like you just have to talk with me. <laughs> but if you want to connect with me personally, I'm I'm all about LinkedIn. So I'm on it all the time. I, I love connecting with folks on LinkedIn. I don't think I'm on any other social media. If I do, I'm not active. So that's one way. And then if you want to shoot me an email, Again, I love connecting with folks in this space. I love learning from others. I love talking to you. I love talking to to other leaders that are are looking to do things differently. So you can shoot me an email at kyle at upmetrics.com. Super simple. And we can set up time to chat and grab a virtual coffee. Or if you're in Dallas, Texas, we'd love to get together in person too. Awesome. Kyle, thank you so much for being my guest today. It was good catching up with you. Thank you, Amanda. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to ESG Decoded. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you consume yours and follow ESG Decoded and Climco across social media platforms. Until our next episode, take what you learned today to drive long-term value for your organization by doing good for people and the planet.